the main motivation is that the notion of platform became very central in uh, the way um, both companies as well as scholars started to uh, talk about uh, changes in uh, the, uh, the media economy more generally. So the notion of platform became sort of the central concept in those discussions. The only problem was that uh, the concept itself had also been occupied partly by corporate interests. So this is something, for example, Tartar Gillespie already wrote about in 2010. So the politics of plat uh, platforms. And uh, so uh, what we wanted to do is uh, try to um, redefine this notion of platform or define it actually more precisely uh, to use it for critical research. Uh, so to, um, to open it up to critical inquiry by uh, showing how that concept uh, or the practices that actually are hiding behind that concept uh, constitute particular market relations, particular infrastructure relations and governance relations. The notion of platformization is really to think about the ways in which uh, platforms and platform companies become involved in a wide variety of spheres of life and um, sectors of the economy. So what we want to understand is how platforms become central, for example, to uh, news production or education or transport or healthcare and so on. So some of these core aspects of public life and uh, what we want to understand is what kinds of logics, what kinds of uh, economic processes what kinds of relations platforms introduce in those sectors. So that's the notion of platformization. And the way we define it is very much related to how we understand the platform, obviously. And we understand platforms as key markets, as key infrastructures and key um, governance frameworks that are basically introduced in those sectors. And that means that also the way those sectors operate uh, become subject to these platform markets, infrastructures, and governance frameworks. What we're observing, but that's also something, you know, many other uh, scholars have obviously observed, right? So um, media companies uh, traditionally work through a, a gatekeeping editorial principle where it's the media company that decides what's, for example, newsworthy or what music is worth sharing or uh, what a particular television program needs to be produced. What happens in the case of platforms is that they um, are infrastructurally and economically relatively open. So they allow a wide variety of different actors to actually share their content through the platform. So if you're a uh, well, so-called citizen journalist or you're an amateur musician or video maker and so on, you can share your content through the platform. There isn't an editorial um, committee or board or editors that decide this is worth it or not, right? You can share it. So in that regard, what is really interesting about platforms is that it kind of opens up uh, the ways in which uh, culture can be shared, distributed, and monetized. Uh, and that originally was understood as a, as a form of democratization, as an emancipation sort of of the, of the individual. The only problem is that, of course, platforms don't just open up. They also um, uh, govern the way content is actually then distributed and monetized. So they, and they do, set, do, do that in all sorts of ways, by curating content and moderating content and by setting particular standards. So in that way, they, they do very much shape uh, culture production, but in a way that uh, that's works differently than in the, in the traditional or legacy media industry. Well, so, um, I mean, I think to, to sort of uh, finish the, the story about the, uh, the transition basically from the selection by uh, traditional media companies to individual producers, so the idea that this is a form of uh, democratization is actually problematic because what we are what we're seeing is that these platform markets tend to be subject to what to so-called network effects so certain um, actors and, and, and actually typically uh, quite 
traditional legacy media companies are very effective in sort of playing platform markets as well as very well resourced uh, creators. So that have a, a, a well-known brand, that have a talent agency support, that have uh, data insights and so on. So they become uh, very visible uh, in, these, uh, in these platform markets and therefore are able to profit uh, from, those, uh, from those markets. So what to do? Then the question, so, so what, what do we do in terms of that concentration? So I think the concentration plays out in two different ways. On the one hand, there is the concentration in terms of platform companies. So we see a, a small number of companies that are uh, providing the dominant markets and that have developed uh, sort of the, infra the underlying infrastructure for a lot that's actually developed and shared uh, on the internet. And therefore, they can also set the terms, right? They, they provide the governance framework. So in terms of, um, so in, uh, the, the answers should be very, actually quite traditional, right? You, the idea is to regulate these companies as, as media companies have always been regulated uh, and, and the way uh, monopolies have always been regulated. So they need to be taxed, right? Because often they are able to evade um, uh, taxes. Uh, and the way they uh, curate content and moderate content should be subjected to similar expectations as what we've seen with traditional media, right? There's a responsibility uh, to uh, combat, for example, disinformation. Uh, there is a, a responsibility uh, that the content that's shared is actually uh, diverse and that uh, a wide variety of different actors have similar opportunities to become visible. So in that way, what we expected from more mass media uh, companies, similar expectations should be developed in relation to platform companies. And I think that's also what we're seeing now in Europe, right? With the uh, DSA, DMA, uh, we're seeing that there are particular expectations now of especially the larger uh, uh, platform companies. Um, yes and no. So I think uh, on the one hand, so if you're, if you're looking at the ways in which artificial intelligence or generative AI is now being developed and the way these large uh, language models are being trained, the, uh, they all, so even though there are many startups, they ultimately, uh, once they start to scale, rely on a, on, a, on a handful of companies that provide the cloud infrastructure for training and hosting and, and, and providing um, uh, uh, those the applications that rely on these models. Uh, so in that sense, I would say that in terms of the cloud infrastructure that underlies this, very clearly the process of platformization is still ongoing, uh, where uh, the companies that provide these particular services are then uh, providing them through these cloud providers to billions of end users. Uh, so in that sense, it's certainly ongoing. And then uh, with the particular application, we can also see that there are um, uh, paid subscriptions, right? And then, of course, end users can connect to uh, service providers through those things. But at the same time, what we're also seeing, and that's actually at the same time also quite worrying, is that many things that were previously distributed, for example, um, the way we access news, uh, might actually, uh, through these models, be um, uh, combined, right? Converging into particular applications where you no longer visit the particular website to learn about the news, but you get it directly, for example, through your search engine, which trains on, uh, on the news content that's available. And it's very clear that News organizations are aware that this is happening, that these models are obviously training on content, for example, of the New York Times uh, or other major uh, news outlets. And uh, I now, of course, are profiting from that content, uh, but are no longer necessarily referring to that content and th to those organizations. So I think that's, that's clearly a threat. And that would, if that's happening, that would mean a further concentration uh, in, um, yeah, in the media economy. Uh, which is something I think media organizations are now uh, challenging. And while the, the uh, case uh, of the New York Times against OpenAI is a good example of this, and I think we'll see more of those examples in the future. 
So, um, so what we observed when we started to do this work already earlier on with uh, the development of the uh, book on the platform society, which I wrote with Jose van Eck and Martijn de Waal, and then later with David Nieborg and Brooke Aaron Duffy on platforms and culture production, is that there is a lot of great research that's done in this field, so um, and indeed in the fields you mentioned, so there's great uh, analysis of economic processes in business studies, there's critical work done in political economy, um, there's very uh, thorough, also um, empirically detailed work being done in software platform studies uh, that uh, sort of traces and uh, provides insight into these computational data infrastructures. Yet what is really missing from our perspective is the connection between these fields. So um, those insights in terms of how platforms work as markets or as infrastructures or as governance frameworks need to be thoroughly connected. And that's what we really try to do. So hopefully, you know, the framework we're developing, which we understand under the heading of platform studies as sort of the field that brings these things together, the field that, um, that we hope at least that future research can really combine these insights from these various traditions. Uh, and that means that we can't in isolation think about a platform market or think in isolation about uh, a, a computational infrastructure, but we need to see the connections between them because otherwise we cannot understand how these platforms then intervene in all these sectors of life and how they might also be regulated.